This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, today we are going to be doing a review of the already best-selling book, The Right Side of History from Ben Shapiro. So this is the first book that Ben Shapiro has released since he's kind of become Ben Shapiro, right? I mean, he's this guy that has just absolutely exploded on the political and social scene in the last several years. He's uh, written a lot of books before, but this is the first book that he has released since he's been a very, very popular uh, show, uh, TV show host, or excuse me, not TV show host, but uh, podcast host, online radio show host. He now has a... uh, national radio show. And so the cool thing about this is uh, Ben Shapiro and his team at The Daily Wire actually sent us an advanced copy of this book. The book just came out Tuesday. So if you're listening to this on time, it came out on Tuesday. So it is in every store that you could possibly imagine right now and online. But we were just tickled to death that he sent us an advanced copy because he wanted us to be able to share this with the audience, uh, with the audience of this podcast. He wanted me to be able to go through some of these things with you all. And so today, uh, this episode won't be an exhaustive review of the book. Uh, I mean, in order to do that, I'd literally have to you know walk you through the entire narrative, which would take you know steam out of you actually reading it, right? Because I want you guys to actually read it. But my goal for you guys for today is to make this book sound appealing enough for you to go out and read this and really read it as soon as possible. And so I'm going to be going through kind of chapter by chapter, looking at some of the macro elements that we're going to see throughout these different chapters. And then hopefully by the end, you've, you've got enough of a taste for it that you want to keep going. But I figured a, a good place to start would be to do the description. So if you go to Amazon or Goodreads or Barnes and Noble, this is a description of the books. I think it, it basically gives you a good primer for what you're going to expect. So here we go. In 2016, Ben Shapiro spoke at UC Berkeley. Hundreds of police officers were required from 10 UC campuses across the state to protect his speech, which was, ironically, about the necessity for free speech and rational debate. He came to argue that Western civilization is in the midst of a crisis of purpose and ideas. Our freedoms are built upon the twin notions that every human being is made in God's image and that human beings were created with reasonable reason capable of exploring God's world. We can thank these values for the birth of science, the dream of progress, human rights, prosperity, peace, and artistic beauty. Jerusalem and Athens built America, ended slavery, defeated the Nazis and the communists, lifted billions from poverty, and gave billions spiritual purpose. Jerusalem and Athens were the foundations of the Magna Carta and the Treaty of Westphalia. They were the foundations of the Declaration of Independence, Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, and Martin Luther King Jr.'s Letter from Birmingham Jail. Civilizations that rejected Jerusalem and Athens have collapsed into dust. The USSR rejected Judeo-Christian values and Greek natural law, substituting a new utopian vision of quote-unquote social justice, and they starved and slaughtered tens of millions of human beings. The Nazis rejected Judeo-Christian values and Greek natural law, and they shoved children into gas chambers. Venezuela rejected Judeo-Christian values and Greek natural law, and citizens of their oil-rich nation have been reduced to eating dogs. We are in the process of abandoning Judeo-Christian values and Greek natural law, favoring instead moral subjectivism and the rule of passion. And we are watching our civilization collapse into age-old tribalism, individualistic hedonism, and moral subjectivism. We believe we can reject Judeo-Christian values and Greek natural law and satisfy ourselves with intersectionality or scientific materialism or progressive politics or authoritarian governance or nationalistic solidarity. We can't. The West is special. And in the right side of history, Ben Shapiro bravely explains that it's because too many of us have lost sight of the moral purpose that drives us each to be better or the sacred duty to work together for the greater good or both. A stark warning and a call to spiritual arms. This book may be the first step in getting our civilization back on track. So there you have it. That's kind of the basic overview. And and guys, really overall, uh, my initial reaction to this book, which I actually just finished right before I started recording this podcast, is it's a really heady book but it is very easy to follow. I mean, guys, this might be the densest 200 page book I've, I've ever seen or certainly ever read. I mean, I remember whenever I got this in the mail, not only did I shriek like a little girl because of how excited I was, but I just thought, oh man, I thought this book was going to be quite a bit longer. I thought it was going to be, you know, three, 400 pages long. And it's really just barely above 200 pages. And it didn't take me, but you know, the first 10, 15 minutes of reading to realize, oh boy, if this was three or 400 pages, I don't know that if I, I, I could have got through it in a way that was beneficial uh, to where I could bring it to you guys in time. And so, um, the thing that's really cool about this book is most of the time, whenever you're reading a book, there are sections of the book that you really enjoy, but you're not really captured by the beginning, right? But this is perhaps the best intro to a book that I've ever seen. 
I mean, and that's something weird to for me to even think about because I mean, I just don't even remember reading a book in the last several years where I was like, oh man, it had me hooked by like the first couple of sentences. But this is the intro to the book. This book is about two mysteries. The first mystery, why are things so good? The second mystery, why are we blowing it? And I just thought like, wow, I mean, I've been listening to Ben Shapiro for a while. I've been following the podcast. I've been following a lot of different things. And he's brought up these elements before, but I just thought it was incredibly interesting to to see him basically start out that way. And I'm going to go ahead and read uh, at different points during this podcast, guys, or consistently through the podcast. I'm going to be reading uh, chunks of the book to you guys. And so uh, I'll do my best to read out loud and not screw up. But at the same time, I I think it's going to help give you a narrative uh, without basically being exhaustive in how we're covering it. So I'm going to, in light of the basically first two mysteries that he talked about, I'm going to read this quote from the introduction here. We are killing ourselves at the highest rate in decades. Rates of depression have skyrocketed. Drug overdoses are now responsible for more deaths than car crashes. Marriage rates have declined and as have childbearing rates. We're spending more money on luxuries and enjoying everything less. Conspiracies have replaced reason and subjective perceptions have replaced objective observation. Facts have been buried to make way for feelings. A society of essential oils and self-esteem has replaced a society of logic. And so, guys, there's there's a lot of information in this book that's going to kind of come down to some of the things that I even just mentioned right there. But there's a couple of central tenets of this book that I want to make sure that I go through. And uh, again, we're going to go through kind of every chapter, but again, I I do want to make sure that we hit some of the big uh, central tenets of this book. And so the first central tenet of this book is that there are four elements that we need in order to generate the moral purpose that provides the foundation for happiness. Okay. So a lot of you guys have read or seen things on happiness and things like that, but you know, there, there's basically the very first chapter of this book after the introduction is called the pursuit of happiness. And we start digging into what exactly that means. So I'm going to be reading from page nine here. We need, in my estimate, four elements, individual moral purpose, individual capacity to pursue that purpose, communal moral purpose, and communal capacity to pursue that purpose. These four elements are crucial. The only foundation for a successful civilization lies in a careful balance of these four elements. Um, And even in addition to that, there was another section there late in uh, the first chapter where he's basically talking about the ingredients of happiness. So I'll be reading from, from pages 17 and 18. And guys, this is from the actual physical book. I know I always talk about, I I do a lot of e-reading and things like that, but for this one, obviously they sent me a physical copy. So if you like hear pages, don't worry about it. There's nobody in here with me. I'm just going to be reading this to you. So here we go. Page 17, talking about the pursuit of happiness. That's from chapter one. Happiness then comprises four elements, individual moral purpose, individual capacity, collective moral purpose, and collective capacity. If we lack one of these elements, the pursuit of happiness becomes impossible. If that pursuit is foreclosed, society crumbles. Our society was built on recognition of these four elements. The fusion of Athens and Jerusalem, tempered by the wit and wisdom of our founding fathers, led to the creation of civilization of unparalleled freedom, replete with virtuous men and women striving to better themselves and the society around them. But we are losing that civilization. We are losing that civilization because we have spent generations undermining the two deepest sources of our own happiness. The sources that lie behind individual moral purpose, communal moral purpose, individual capacity, and communal capacity. These two sources, divine meaning and reason. There can be no individual or communal moral purpose without a foundation of divine meaning. There can be no individual capacity or communal capacity without a constant abiding belief in the nature of our reason. The history of the West is built on the interplay between these two pillars, divine meaning and reason. We receive our notions of divine meaning from a three millennia old lineage stretching back to the ancient Jews. We receive our notions of reason from the 2,500 year old lineage stretching back to the ancient Greeks. In rejecting those lineages, in seeking to graft ourselves to rootless philosophical movements of the moment, cutting ourselves off from our own roots, we have damned ourselves to an existential wandering. We must make our way back towards our roots. Those roots took hold at Sinai. And this is where we get into the second central tenet of this book, and that is that Western society is the result of Jerusalem and Athens. You hear him talk about Jerusalem and Athens throughout this entire podcast, or sorry, throughout this entire book. But I'm going to go back to a quote from the introduction, which basically sets up this idea. So here we go. We believe freedom is built upon the twin notions that God created every human in his image, and that human beings are capable of investigating and exploring God's world. Those notions were born in Jerusalem and Athens, respectively. 
Those twin notions, those diamonds of spiritual genius built our civilization, built us as individuals. If you believe that life is more than materialistic pleasures and pain avoidance, you are a product of Jerusalem and Athens. If you believe that the government has no right to intrude upon the exercise of your individual will, and that you are bound by moral duty to pursue virtue, you are a product of Jerusalem and Athens. If you believe that human beings are capable of bettering our world through use of our reason and are bound by higher purpose to do so, you are the product of Jerusalem and Athens. Jerusalem and Athens built science. The twin ideals of Judeo-Christian values and Greek natural law, reasoning built human rights. They built prosperity, peace, and artistic beauty. Jerusalem and Athens built America, ended slavery, defeated the Nazis and the communists, lifted billions from poverty, and gave billions spiritual purpose. Jerusalem and Athens were the foundations of the Magna Carta and the Treaty of Westphalia, and they were the foundations of the Declaration of Independence, Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, and Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail. Civilizations that rejected Jerusalem and Athens and the tension between them have collapsed into dust. The USSR rejected Judeo-Christian values and Greek natural law, substituting the values of the collective in the new utopian vision of social justice. And they starved and slaughtered tens of millions of human beings. The Nazis rejected Judeo-Christian values and Greek natural law, and they shoved children into gas chambers. Venezuela rejected Judeo-Christian values and Greek natural law, and the citizens of their oil-rich nation have been reduced to eating dogs. So again, you'll uh, remember a lot of that because we read that in the introduction. But that really does help set up this section, which is uh, from chapter two. So chapter one was basically just setting up the idea that we were going to be going into in this book. And that was after the introduction. But chapter two is called From the Mountaintop. And so this is where we start getting into Jerusalem. And it basically gives the argument for Jerusalem as an essential element that undergirds the West. And so uh, it really just starts uh, on chapter uh, in chapter two on page 20 on the importance of revel- uh, revelation uh, in terms of how we got to where we are right now. So I'm going to read you a quote quote from page 20 and 21. The revelation at Sinai is approximately 1313 BCE, according to traditional biblical belief, changed the world by infusing it with meaning for those who knew the story. In particular, Judaism, as later we'll see Christianity, granted individual purpose and communal purpose. It did so through four faith-based claims that were utterly different from the pagan religions before it. First, Judaism claimed that God was unified, that a master plan stood behind everything. Second, Judaism stated that human beings were held to particular behavioral standards for moral, not utilitarian reasons. We were ordered to be moral at the behest of a highest power, even if God's rule could benefit us in this life. Third, Judaism claimed that the history progressed, that revelation was the beginning, but it was not the end, and that man had a responsibility to pursue God and bring about the redemption of mankind, and that God could use a particular example, a chosen people, to act as a light unto the nations. Finally, Judaism claimed that God had endowed man with choice, that men were responsible for their choices, and that our choices mattered. And from that point in chapter two, we start to get towards the concept of oughtness, right? You hear a lot of uh, talk about, you know, different types of uh, philosophies in terms of some that require some sort of oughtness and others do not. So we're going to start reading from page 27 here. Why then does the Bible focus so much on seemingly pagan sacrifices? Because biblical sacrifices are designed merely to appease a higher power. They're designed to change us, to teach us something. Maimonides argues that sacrifices were originally designed to woo polytheists towards monotheism by repurposing an ingrained cultural ritual and directing it away from sheer appeasement and towards self-betterment. According to Maimonides, sacrifices are intended to remind us that we ought to pay for our sins ourselves and that only the mercy of God allows us to escape that accountability. The Talmud openly acknowledges that we could use reason to learn certain character traits. Judaism suggests that we can, in fact, determine certain moral injunctions. Even ignoramuses, Judaism believes, can determine that there is a God and that murder is wrong, for example. But such learning is incomplete, Judaism holds. Reason can teach us how not to be bad, how not to harm others, for example. The seven no-hide laws that govern humanity before revelation are all designed to minimize human cruelty. Bans on murder, theft, idolatry, sexual immorality, animal cruelty, cursing God, and the positive commandments to set up courts of law in order to punish crimes. And those no-hide laws are incumbent on everyone, regardless of whether they even know about the Bible, specifically because they're so perfectly obvious. But revelation teaches us how to be good. It teaches us which values we ought to hold dear, which characteristics we ought to cultivate, Revelation is necessary to raise us beyond the realm of the mediocre. And so that kind of gets us into the concept of oughtness. And really, as we kind of wrap up uh, this second chapter from the mountaintop, we look at how revelation is only part of the equation. So obviously, there there's a lot of different things that, that go into explaining uh, the overall philosophy of this book. But uh, this is a very, very important one here as we're wrapping up our conversation on revelation. 
And so here we go to the last few paragraphs of chapter two. In short, the Bible presents a fulsome view of human happiness, but one that requires further elucidation. The Bible tells us what God expects of us and tells us that we have the duty to fulfill those expectations. It tells us that we are special and that we are loved by an infinitely good, caring, and powerful being. It tells us that we have the duty to reach out to Him. The Bible makes God accessible. It brings God down to earth. In doing so, it offers man the opportunity to raise himself. But the biblical tradition does not stress the ability of people to reason a priori. Revelation stands above reason. And revelation alone is not enough. The soul with which God endowed man seeks the divine through reason, the uniquely human quality that lifts human beings above animals and places us at the foot of God's throne. To seek a higher moral purpose, human beings would have to cultivate their reason. For that, they turned to Athens. And so that gets us into chapter three of this book, and that's when we're really going to get into Athens. And chapter three is called From the Dust. And this really gives us the argument for Athens as an essential element, just like Jerusalem, that kind of undergirds the West. And so the first section I want to read here, starting on page 41, is the power of Western civilization. So back to the book. This is a dramatic, deliberate misreading of the history of Western civilization, the greatest force for good in world history. The statement is not meant to ignore the myriad evils in which Western civilization has participated, but Western civilization has freed more people than any other by a long shot. It has reduced poverty, conquered disease, and minimized war. Western civilization is responsible for the economic betterment of the global population and for the rise in human rights and democracy. And that civilization has deep roots. Why should Americans bother to learn about ancient Greeks? Because the classical roots of Western civilization in Athens still have much to teach us. Athens teaches us that we are capable of doing as human beings. Athens teaches us we have the ability to use our reason to reach beyond ourselves. Athens teaches us not only how to how liberty can flourish, but why it should. I've argued that without Jerusalem, there could be no West. Without Athens, the same holds true. Religious faith is empowering because it tells human beings that they are loved and that they have the capacity to choose between good and evil. But religious faith also requires us to acknowledge the inherent limits on human capacity. It requires us to say that there are things we will never understand, that we are earthly creatures bounded by dust. But if the project of Sinai was about elevating man above the animals by associating him with a godly mission and granting him a godly soul, the project of Athens was about elevating the man using man's own faculties. Religion doesn't discount the capacity of mankind, of course, but that capacity is always secondary to God's will. Athens elevates man's capacity and makes it primary. And so that really gives us the overall power. It gives us that argument for the power of Western civilization. But we have to look at what is the foundations of Greek principles. Because basically uh, what Ben Shapiro is going to be talking about here is that there are three foundations for Greek principles that kind of undergird what we're talking about here with Athens. So back to the book on the same page, page 42. Utilizing human reason to escape the cave and bringing knowledge of the light, that was the task of ancient Athens, a task uniting Plato, 428 to 348 BCE, and Aristotle, 384 to 322 BCE. The ancient Greeks gave us three foundational principles. First, that we could discover our purpose in life from looking at the nature of the world. Second, that in order to learn about the nature of the world, we had to study the world around us by utilizing our reason. And finally, that reason could help us construct the best collective systems for cultivating that reason. In short, the Greeks gave us natural law, science, the basis of secularly constructed government. Jerusalem brought the heavens down to earth. Athens' elevation of reason would launch mankind towards the stars. Okay, and so that gets us a little bit deeper into why Athens is so important. But then there's also the importance of telos. Okay, and so that may be a new word for a lot of you guys, but basically that's a Greek word for ultimate objective or aim. And so a lot of guys uh, don't really understand where this this comes from or how this really works in. But Ben Shapiro does a fantastic job of basically bringing Greek telos into a lot of the different sections of this book. But this first part here in chapter two, uh, or it's a quote from chapter three, from the dust, that gives us an idea of of where that comes from and why it's important. So I'm going to go to page 45 here of uh, chapter three. Whereas modern systems of morality focus far more on whether given actions are good or evil, ancient ethical systems worried less about the rules for action and more about making men and women virtuous people, people capable of fulfilling their telos as human beings and utilizing reason and character to carry out complex moral equations. Okay, so again, there, there's a lot to unpack here, and it's it's just not really my job to go in here and unpack all of this because there's just so much content. Even as I'm as I'm you know flipping through right now, there's just a, an unbelievable amount of content. But we're gonna move on from chapter three, and we're gonna go to chapter four, where it starts to kind of meld together Jerusalem and Athens. Like, how did these things come together? And as you might uh, expect. 
there's a big influence here from Christianity. And so I'm going to do one quote from this section here, but it basically gives us an idea of how Christianity really brought Jerusalem and Athens together. And this is from page 57. So here we go. The birth of Christianity represented the first serious attempt to merge Jewish thought with Greek thought. The Christian admixture was far more Jewish than Greek in its vision of God and of man's quest in the world, but it was also far more Greek than Jewish in its universality. Okay, And so, really, the rest of this chapter really digs even farther into that entire concept right there. I mean, for me to even uh, give it lip service right now would be <laughs> really inappropriate, but chapter four is an incredible melding of these two ideas, and so, again, that's, that's the reason why you got to buy the book, so that you can experience that for yourself. So now we're going to get into chapter five, and that's called Endowed by Their Creators. And so this is where we're starting to see the first huge uh, re revelations of certain elements that are uh, additionally foundational. And so I'm going to go ahead and do a quote from page 74 of chapter five, Endowed by Their Creators. By the end of the 13th century, Western civilization was completely dominated by Catholicism. That dominion stretched across Europe, giving new freedom to thinkers like Aquinas, but it also masked serious religious tensions among various orders, as well as even deeper tensions with secular rulers who felt threatened by the arrogation of power to the church. Furthermore, the reign of Catholicism masked serious conflicts within the church itself. All these conflicts frequently broke out into open conflict. In 1303, for example, Pope Boniface VIII found himself arrested by forces in the pay of France's King Philip IV, which resulted in the temporary exile of the papacy from Rome itself. From this era of challenges, two strong new ideas emerged. First, human beings are capable of exploring the world and bettering their material condition in it. Second, each human being is free and endowed with natural rights. Skepticism of centralized political power grew from centuries of political and religious conflict, Optimism in the power of the science grew in new discoveries made in light of the liberated individual mind. The Renaissance and the Enlightenment completed the foundations of the West that built our world. And this really goes right into the power of science. And so you, you might be wondering how does science really work into all this, but there, there's really huge sections of this book that are dedicated to science and how it's important for us to understand where that comes from. So I'm going to go ahead and continue reading here on page 74 in chapter 5. The explosion of science in the West is perhaps the West's best-known, most celebrated legacy. The story of technological development has never changed. Human beings want to live more comfortably in the world. But the story of science changed radically beginning with Thomas Aquinas and Franciscan friar William of Ockham and their successors. Human beings sought the cosmos through science and used that newfound knowledge to develop technologies that would later be thought to obviate the need for God himself. The secularist myth holds that religion held back science for millennia. The reverse is true. Without Judeo-Christian foundations, science simply would not exist as it does in the West. We're going to skip to a section here on page 76. Galileo was no exception. He was a representative of the rule. Religious men saw a duty to examine the universe and to do so with the best possible methodology. This philosophy permeated the wisdom of the Enlightenment's greatest scientists. Johannes Kepler, 19... Or 1571 through 1630, the discoverer of the laws of planetary motion explained, the chief aim of all investigations of the external world should be to discover the rational order and harmony which has been imposed on it by God and which he revealed to us in the language of mathematics. Kepler routinely described his own physics as part and parcel of Aristotelian metaphysics and explained that the laws of nature are within the grasp of the human mind. God wanted us to recognize them by creating us after his own image that we could share in his thoughts. Kepler's philosophy was also that of Isaac Newton, 1642 to 1726. Opposite to God is atheism, in profession and idolatry, in practice. Atheism is so senseless and odious to mankind that it never had many professors. And so, obviously, when you get into that section, you're looking more at how important science has been to the overall idea and, and the, the major macro ideas that we're seeing within our society. But that really sends us into another section that is going to give us a better idea of where science is having its biggest impact here. So we're going to go back to the book, page 78. Unlike modern social scientists, however, Bacon took his cue, they're talking about Francis Bacon here, took his cue for governance and ethics from the Judeo-Christian tradition. While Bacon upheld the importance of the scientific method and a belief in a pure value of innovation to better the material lives of human beings, Bacon was no atheist. He derided the notion of a godless universe in harsh terms, suggesting that while a little philosophy inclineth man's mind to atheism, depth in philosophy bringeth men's mind about to religion. Bacon wrote this prayer in Novum Arganum, 
Let none be alarmed at the objection of the arts and sciences become depraved to malevolent or luxurious purposes and the like, and for the same can be said of every worldly good. Talent, courage, strength, beauty, riches, light itself, and the rest. Only let mankind regain their rights over nature, assigned to them by the gift of God, and obtain that power, whose exercise will be governed by right reason and true religion. This last statement is the attempt to read ancient thought and Christianity back into science over his own objections. Bacon's confidence in man's mind to better the world, in accordance, of course, with the right reason and true religion, saw further development from René Descartes, 1596 to 1650, who also discarded speculations on behalf of useful knowledge. He saw meaning not in, the in theology, but in science, full knowledge of which would surely carry mankind forward toward the perfect moral science. As with Bacon, the good of man lay not in the search for God or the pursuit of a virtuous telos, but in the quest for a better material state of man. Morality would surely follow in the wake of man's technological progress and increase scientific knowledge. Such knowledge, Descartes believed, could not be pursued without radical skepticism of received wisdom. I ought to reject as absolute false, absolutely false all opinions in regard to which I could suppose the least ground for doubt. In order to ascertain whether after that there remained aught in my belief that was wholly indubitable. <clears throat> this led Descartes to doubt all of his senses, except his knowledge of his own thinking. Thus Descartes stated, Cogito ergum sum, I think, therefore I am. From this basis he reintroduced a good God who would not create senses that lie to us. Both Bacon and Descartes, while discarding uh, the teleology of the ancients, maintained faith in the Bible and in God. But they also laid the groundwork for the rise of deism, and in time for the fall of religion itself. By cutting final causes from science, by separating God from the natural world, the modern scientific project would eventually remove religion and purpose from the domain of reason, a project that both Bacon and Descartes would have abhorred. And then this is where we start getting into some really, really important territory, which is where we get the concept of the individual. So this is kind of the emergence of that concept. So back to the book. Hobbes, however, had opened a door that he could not close again. If human beings had individual rights, did those rights end merely with survival? Or in a state of nature, did human beings enjoy inalienable rights beyond merely breathing and eating and not being murdered? The philosopher who asked the question was John Locke, 1632 to 1704. Following in Hobbes' footsteps, Locke believed that sovereignty resided in the individual. Locke, a deeply religious Christian, believed in both natural law discoverable by reason and a Hobbesian natural right inherent in human existence. Natural law, like the ancients supposed, could be discovered in nature, a law dictating through right reason both correct behavior and the purpose for life. Locke based his beliefs in human reason, sovereignty, and equality not merely in the ancient philosophy, but in the book of Genesis, in God's suggestion that man is made in his image. Natural rights, according to Locke, were those rights that sprang from exercise of natural law, a right to property, since we had a corresponding duty not to steal, a right to life, since we had a duty not to kill, a right to liberty, since we had a duty not to oppress, those rights carried them with them duties as well. The right to property carried with it the duty to cultivate that property, for example, since God had granted the earth to all people in common, and that our self-ownership to the exclusion of others allowed us to mix our labor with land and thereby transforming it. And so this is where we first start getting into the concept of the individual, but then how that individual is is you know, basically applied to America gets into some very, very important territory because we start getting it really into the minutia of how the concept of the individual affected us as Americans. So here we go back to the book. Most important for American history, Locke openly recognized a right to rebel against a government that violated the rights of, the, of its citizens. Any government doing so would allow citizens to revert to a state of nature in which the citizens could set up a new government. Whenever the legislators endeavor to take away and destroy the property of the people or to reduce them to slavery under arbitrary power, they put themselves into the state of war with the people, who are thereupon absolved from any farther obedience and are left to the common refuge, which God hath provided for all men, against force and violence. Power devolves to the people who have the right to resume their original liberty. Locke's philosophy would not merely influence the founding fathers of the United States, as we will see. It would shape the foundations of free market enterprise. The vision of Adam Smith, 1723 to 1790, of natural liberty also precisely mirrors Locke's vision of natural right. The obvious and simple system of natural liberty establishes itself of its own accord. Every man, as long as he does not violate the laws of injustice, is left perfectly free to pursue his own interests his own way, and to bring both his industry and capital into competition with those of any other man or order of men. Smith posited that the government had but three fundamental duties, pers preservation of life, preservation of liberty through administration of justice, and funding for public goods. 
His viewpoint would be deeply influential in the formation of the greatest economy in the history of mankind. And this really goes right into a a foundational discussion of the American triumph in this area. So we'll just keep on reading here. This long philosophical journey would come to fruition in the first country in the history to be crafted based on philosophy, the United States of America. The founding fathers were devotees of Cicero and Locke, of the Bible and Aristotle. They'd done their reading, and they based their new national philosophy on the lessons garnered from that reading. Natural law, rooted in the reason and enshrined by religion, individual natural rights, balanced by corresponding duties, a limited government of checks and balances designed to protect those rights in accordance with natural law, and inculcation of virtue to be pursued by individuals and communities, again in accordance with the dictates of natural law. The founders weren't heedless narcissists, unconcerned with the dangers of radical individualism. They feared a society of religionless individuals, nor were they tyrannical collectivists. They feared mob rule and the heavy hand of government cramming subjective definitions of virtue down the throats of individuals. So as you can imagine, you you start hearing a lot about the individual, but you don't really have effective individualism if you don't have virtue. Okay, so back to the book here. Rights and duties, according to the founders, were simply two sides of the same coin. While some critics of the founders have claimed that they ignored duties on behalf of rights, thereby setting the course for societal disintegration, that's a misreading of the founding philosophy. As George Washington stated in his first inaugural address, quote, the foundation of our national policy will be laid in the pure and immutable principles of private morality. There exists in the economy and course of nature an indissoluble union between virtue and happiness. And here we have the culmination of these ideas here. The the founding ideology was the basis for the greatest experiment in human progress and liberty ever devised by the mind of man. But then again, it was an idea developed through Judeo-Christian principles and Greek rationality, molded and shaped over time by circumstance, purified in the flame of conflict. It was the best that men have done and the best that men will do in setting philosophic framework for human happiness. Skipping along here, bottom of page 91. The founding philosophy also glorified the power of individual capacity. The founders were fully cognizant that human beings have the capacity for evil as well as good, for passion as well as reason, and they had immense faith in the power of reason to impel human beings towards proper thinking. Jefferson stated in the Bill for Establishing Religious Freedom in Virginia in 1779, quote, The opinions and belief of men depend not on their own will, but follow involuntarily the evidence proposed to their minds, that Almighty God hath created the mind free and manifested his supreme will, that free it shall remain by making it altogether insusceptible of restraint, unquote. John Adams identified liberty itself with the power of reason. Quote, it implies thought and choice and power, and it can elect between objects, indifferent in the point of morality, neither morality, neither morally good nor morally evil. Unquote. The only thing, according to Adam, according to Adams, that would turn reason toward good was a societal inculcation of good and a general pursuit of knowledge itself. Quote, my humble opinion is that knowledge upon the whole promotes virtue and happiness. Unquote. And so there's obviously some huge ideas that come from here, but at the same time, whenever you have the culmination of these ideas, obviously we've seen there's been a little bit of an erosion of these philosophies, right? Because those were the philosophies of the founding fathers, but here we are several hundred years later, and we're trying to figure out where we've gotten to where we are at this moment. And so let's talk about where it began to erode, and this is at the end of chapter five called Endowed by Their Creators. The philosophy of the founders made material in the creation of the United States and in the continuing quest to fulfill their ideals has been the greatest blessing for mankind in human history. The United States has freed billions of people, it has enriched billions of people, and has opened minds and hearts. But that founding philosophy, the crown jewel of the West, has not prevailed. It has, instead, been gradually decaying. With that decay, the foundations for human happiness have been eroding. We, in our day, may be watching them collapse completely. How could such a collapse occur? Gradually, slowly, and then all at once. So this gets us into chapter six, which is called Killing Purpose and Killing Capacity. And so this will follow up on that idea. So I'm going to read a a fairly lengthy section here that's going to kind of give you the basis of the idea. And it's just the beginning of the chapter here. Seemingly every year in the United States, a great debate breaks out regarding the separation of church and state. The headlines change, but the underlying conflict does not. It may be a court case about removing the Ten Commandments monument from a public space, or about prayer in the public schools, or about forcing a religious baker to create a custom cake for a same-sex wedding. The root conflict is always the same. Was America built on secular grounds, or religious grounds, or both? More important, will America be made better by curbing religion in the name of secularism, or vice versa? Now, I have argued that the founding philosophy was based on both secular reason and religious morality, that modernity was built on these twin poles, cultivated and perfected through the fires of religious warfare and secular argument. 
We built a civilization that was practical and purposeful, religious and rational, virtuous and ambitious. Individual capacity and communal capacity has been brought into harmony. Citizens had committed to Judeo-Christian values and individual rights, working to bolster one another. Individual purpose and communal purpose have been aligned. Individuals were set free to cultivate virtue, and com communities were built to set the framework for that pursuit of happiness. But advocates for the so-called Enlightenment offer a different theory. They suggest that the philosophy of modern West, the philosophy of individual rights particularly, sprang from rejection of religion and embrace of reason. The proponents of self-proclaimed age of reason flatter themselves and that we live today in accordance with the thought of great Enlightenment thinkers, bold new minds who sprang forth from the ground wholly formed, ready to do battle with and triumph over the ancients. In fact, the very term Enlightenment suggests a pre-Enlightenment era in which religion inhibited human development rather than fostering it, and by extension suggests that belief in Judeo-Christian values and God himself was the best, at best, an obstruction to modern Western civilization. Furthermore, the most ardent believers in the Enlightenment derided the Greek search for telos as misguided, resting as it does on the assumption of the reality lying between material reality. They believe that Enlightenment thought could only progress by jettisoning teleology itself and substituting materialism. They argue that the Enlightenment only became the Enlightenment by killing God and discarding the idea of an objectively discoverable purpose. The Enlightenment, they say, shed the vestigial organs of religion and Greek teleology and took civilization to new uncharted heights. Unfortunately, these claims are manifestly false. As we've seen, history is necessary. If it weren't, Enlightenment could have sprung up anywhere at any time. Perhaps it should have arisen earlier in societies without the barriers of Greek telos and Judeo-Christian religion. It didn't. It didn't because the philosophy of individual rights springing from the biblical beliefs in individual human beings are created in God's image and that individual virtue matters were key to the Enlightenment. So was the search for knowledge, a search rooted in belief that God had a master plan for the universe, that human beings were blessed with the free will and the reason to investigate that plan, and that we had a moral duty to seek God and to better our own situations materially and spiritually through that search. A devotion to progress is hi in history began with Judeo-Christian religion as well. Most important, Judeo-Christian thought and Greek thought both held in common the belief in purpose. But advocates of the revisionist Enlightenment history say, what if the Judeo-Christian belief system and the Greek devotion to reason were necessary to build Western civilization, but later prevented Western civilization from fully realizing its potential? What if the ideas of Judeo-Christianity in Greece weren't foundational? What if they were more like a scaffolding, to be removed from the structure as the West's thought solidified? What if we could pick and choose our favorite ideas from the Enlightenment canon and junk all the rest? As we've seen, and as we'll see, we've tried it. It failed. In reality, just as with every other philosophical development in history, the Enlightenment had its upside, the glories of American founding philosophy and Western classical liberalism, both of which were direct outgrowths of Athens and Jerusalem, and it had its downside. What was the downside? That downside began with the purposeful destruction of the Judeo-Christian values and Greek teleology. It turns out that those thinkers had maintained the wisdom those twin foundations built the power and glory of the modern West. Those who sought to chip away from those foundations would eventually emerge victorious, and the victory would plant seeds for the existential crisis of meaning from which the West suffers more deeply every day. And even their supposed devotion to reason itself would be consumed by their reflexive instinct to tear down the old no matter how objectively good it was. So this chapter really ends with uh, some big warnings, right? So we, there's two people that are talked about here. He's talking about Dostoevsky and Nietzsche. And he's basically talking about these two people that are basically pointing towards where the philosophies that we've discussed, like where those things will go. And so this is a quick, uh, quick little paragraph from the end of chapter six. This is on page 119, if you're following along. What Nietzsche observed and what he lauded had been underway for generations. Philosophy spent two centuries killing Judeo-Christian values in Greek teleology, or at least discarding them in favor of brave new utopias filled with perfectible human beings, or crystal palaces ruled by men of reason, or worlds of determinism filled with avoidance of pain and maximization of pleasure. So obviously, we know what's happened after this, and this leads us, um, when you're starting to get into the 19th and 20th century, this leads us into chapter 7, which is called The Remaking of the World. 
Now, this is perhaps uh, the most dense chapter in the book. Uh, I don't think it's the longest chapter, but it, it the ideals that are that are revealed here are incredibly dense. But interestingly enough, I feel like the introduction, uh, the introductory several paragraphs, and the you know conclusion of this chapter really kind of tie a good bow on this. And so we're going to be skipping a huge section of chapter seven. But I'm going to go ahead and read the first part of chapter seven and the last part here. So let's go ahead and go into the intro. And this is from the chapter called "The Remaking of the World." Why can't we all be reasonable? This is the characteristic call of our age. Forget values. Forget judgment. Let's just be reasonable with one another. Tolerance can supplant Judeo-Christian ideas. We all know what's right deep down. If we follow our star, civilization won't just survive, it will thrive and flourish. This idea is a vestige of the Enlightenment mentality, but it ignores the dark side of the Enlightenment hope. It ignores the history of the 19th and 20th centuries. It ignores the fact that the Enlightenment had two strains, one based on Athens and Jerusalem, and the other bereft of them. History performed a comparative study in which form of Enlightenment worked best, and the results were clear and convincing. The Enlightenment straddled two sides of a thin line. On the one side was the American Enlightenment, based on the consummation of the long history of thought stretching back to Athens and Jerusalem down through Great Britain and the Glorious Revolution, to the New World, and the other was the European Enlightenment, which rejected Athens and Jerusalem in order to build new worlds beyond discoverable purpose and divine revelation. The juxtaposition between the American Revolution and the French Revolution demonstrates the contrast between the strains of Enlightenment thinking. The American Revolution, based on Lockean principles regarding the God-given rights of individuals, the value of social virtue, and a state system created to preserve inalienable individual rights, broke sharply with the French Revolution, based on Rousseau's general will, Voltaire's generalized scorn for traditional virtue, and an optimistic sense of the perfectibility of mankind through the application of virtue-free reason. And as promised, we'll skip to the end of this chapter and go into the last few paragraphs because it kind of sums up what we're going to be talking about. And it's called A World in Ash. This is what this last session is. In World War II, all three of these prominent collectivist worldviews came into direct conflict. And somewhere between 50 and 80 million people died. Romantic nationalism engulfed Nazi Germany, along with a worship of centralized bureaucracy and scientific governance. And 6 million Jews were mowed down by German bullets or gassed in death camps. The Soviet Union saw its own population as fodder for the preservation of the state, sending its citizens to die on the front lines of Stalingrad with no guns in their hands but guns at their backs. The United States interned 117,000 Japanese. By the end of the war, the great hope of the telos-free, godless enlightenment had faded from view, or, more precisely, it had been buried under the mountains of corpses from World Wars I and II. The West was suddenly in crisis. Despite massive technological improvements, and in part because of such improvements, the human race had nearly wiped itself off the planet. Science had not solved the search for purpose. In fact, with the discovery of atomic weaponry, it seemed that the West had come to the brink of its own annihilation. The great dream of redefining human beings, discovering transcendent values without reference to God or universal purpose, seemed to have died. While some still held out hope in the West for the eventual triumph of the Soviet experiment, with the revelation of Stalin's crimes, that hope too faded. What would replace that hope now? So those ideals kind of lead us to chapter 8, which is called After the Fire, which is very similar to chapter 7 in that it's a very dense chapter, a lot of things to go through, but I feel like the intro and the outro of this chapter give us a good idea of kind of what we're going to get into. So let me go ahead and read the intro here. The world survived World War II, of course. Not only did the West survive, it got freer, richer, more prosperous than ever. Human wealth expanded exponentially. Lifespans increased. But there remained a hole at the center of the Western civilization. A meaning-shaped hole. That hole has grown larger and larger in the decades since. A cancer eating away at our heart. We tried to fill it with the will to action. We tried to fill it with science. We tried to fill it with world-changing political activism. None of it provided us the meaning we seek. By the end of World War II, European optimism was dead and buried beneath six feet of human ash. The philosophies of the Europeans, enlightenment ideals above the value of human beings, and the need to move beyond God or Greek teleology had ended in tragedy. Hitler claimed ideological forebears in Kant, Hegel, and Nietzsche. Stalin took his cues from Marx, and eugenicists took their ideas from Darwin and Compton. The post lock enlightenment projected that project had been a Tower of Babel, with a common goal of supplanting reason for religion rather than seeking the congruence of the two. As the Tower began to challenge God, its builders went to war with one another, speaking languages all their own. And then the Tower fell, and the land was left barren. Europe had buried millions of its sons and daughters, the West had placed its bet on mankind, and reaped the whirlwind. 
And so the rest of this chapter is kind of spent with some of this uh, neo enlightenment thinking and kind of what that had led to, and also kind of what a lot of these neo enlightenment uh, types of individuals have tried to claim. And so he kind of calls them out. And this is the uh, the outro for this chapter after the fire. Carving off the roots of the western tree while hoping to maintain the integrity of the trunk amidst high winds is an exercise in wishful thinking. In December 2017, I discussed this in issue precisely with Sam Harris, who was arguing that the Bible was a rotten text filled with awful lessons. I told him, the moral system by which you suggest that a portion of the Bible should be removed is built on the moral system of the Bible, developed over 2,000 years. When Harris protested that his most considered view of ethics came from a broader framework of studies, I answered, I'm not talking about your browsing and world literature. I'm talking about the fundamental moral precepts that you took to be moral from the time you were a child arise from the Western civilization predicated on Judeo-Christian notions of good and bad. Enlightenment ideals didn't arise in a vacuum, and treating them as though they can survive and thrive without the water and oxygen that nourished them for thousands of years, revelation and reason, telos and purpose, free will and responsibility, isn't likely to sustain those ideals beyond those who read the neo-enlightenment philosophers and scientists. The neo-enlightenment isn't teachable. Attempt to transplant it to the soil of other cultures, and it withers. Don't get me wrong. I think that Harris and Pinker and Shermer are doing and reviving Enlightenment ideals is spectacular. I agree with a lot of the Enlightenment ideals, particularly regarding individual liberty and natural rights, as we've discussed. But the new scientific Athenians will have to come and will have to make common cause with the devotees of Jerusalem rather than making war on them. The same holds true in reverse. For, as it turns out, there are larger philosophical threats to Western civilization that require our attention. And this gets us into the last chapter before the outro, which is called The Return to Paganism. And so the sections that I really wanted to go through here were talking about the rise of kind of the self-esteem movement and the rise of intersectionality, which obviously if you've been following Ben Shapiro for any length of time, intersectionality is something that he's talked about a lot and something that he has uh, really fought against. So I'm going to read a section here that kind of gets into a little bit of that self-esteem movement and intersectionality. This pathetic illogic has even extended into the realm of scientific staffing. The National Science Foundation, a federal funding agency for science, says that it wants to pursue a, quote, diverse STEM workforce, unquote. Not the best scientists of all races, but a specifically diverse group. To that end, the NS. F spent millions funding projects on implicit bias research, one of the least verified, most hyped attempts to ferret out secret racism ever attempted, as well as $500,000 on studying intersectionality. Science departments around the country are seeking not those with the highest scores or the best credentials, but those with special contributions to diversity. As Heather McDonald points out, the American Astronomical Society has now asked PhD programs to stop using the graduate record exam, the GRE, in physics for applicants, since too few women were doing well. The same is happening in medicine, where schools have been encouraged to stop using the medical college admission test, the MCAT, for ethnic minorities. The impact, from 2013 to 2016, medical schools nationally admitted 57% of black applicants with a low MCAT of 24 to 26, but only 8% of whites and 6% of Asians with those same low scores, according to Claremont McKenna, Professor Frederick Lynch. How it helps patients to have less qualified but more ethnically diverse heart surgeons remains unexplained. We've seen this sort of anti-scientific blatherskite rear its ugly head over and over. Former Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers lost his job as president of Harvard University when professors voted to oust him. Summers had the temerity to cite studies suggesting that there are more men who fall on both the higher and lower ends of the spectrum of test score distribution, thereby creating a disparity in the distribution of men and women in particular science and mathematics jobs. Jordan Peterson, professor at the University of Toronto, received a letter from his administration warning him that his refusal to use transgender pronouns was contrary to the rights of those persons to equal treatment without discrimination based on their gender identity and gender expression. The letter suggested that Peterson's insistence on using correct pronouns in accordance with biology had been, quote, emotionally disturbing and painful, unquote, for some students. Lindsay Shepard, a graduate student at Wilfrid Laurie in Canada, was disciplined after showing a video of Peterson discussing the use of made-up pronouns in order to placate transgender people. At Boise State, Professor Scott Yunner was called on the carpet for the great sin of writing a piece suggesting that radical feminism's insistence that gender was a societal construct had paved the way for the transgender rights movement. Students walked out on Evergreen State College Professor Heather Haying as she pointed out that men are taller than women. Haying's husband, Professor Brett Weinstein, lost his job at Evergreen when he refused to leave campus after black students demanded that white teachers not teach on a particular day. Students called him a racist and led a takeover of campus buildings. College speakers ranging from Charles Murray to Heather McDonald to Christina Hoff Summers have been run off campus, usually following violent protests for the sin of citing statistics. 
Better false statistics and bad social science than to violate someone's sense of self-esteem. This anti-scientific, anti-reason nonsense is a return to the random chaos of the pagan, a belief in subjectivity above objectivity, a belief in lack of control over your own fate, a belief that reason itself is merely a reflection of power dynamics. The same scientific method, reliance on reason, and belief in individual worth that led to the greatest surge of wealth in human history are now under assault, all on behalf of the quest for self-realization and self-worth. All of this deeply damaging to precisely the people who are supposed to be freed by it. Intersexual thinking promotes a victim mentality entirely at odds with the pursuit of fulfillment and success. If you are told repeatedly that your self-esteem is threatened by the system and the structure, and that even statistics and science must not offend you, if you are taught that your bliss matters more than objective truth, you become weak and fragile, unable to cope in the real world. Social psychologist Jonathan Haidt of New York University points out that the most effective type of therapy for distorted thinking is cognitive behavioral therapy, therapy, in which people are taught to break chains of thought by using reason and evaluation, precisely the opposite of what our modern universities have been doing. The recent collegiate trend of uncovering allegedly racist, sexist, classist, or otherwise discriminatory microaggressions doesn't incidentally teach students to focus on small or accidental slights, he writes. Its purpose is to get students to focus on them and then relabel the people who have made such remarks as aggressors. This, Height concludes, makes society more censorious and makes students more psychologically unstable. The new protectiveness may be teaching students to think pathologically. Even worse, people who perceive themselves as victims are more likely to become aggressors. As social psychologist Roy Baumeister explains, many violent people believe that their actions were justified by the offensive acts of the person who became their victim, which is precisely what we've seen from campus rioters and social media malcontents in the movement to use government force to shut down that particular types of disapproved speech. But we are told at least this new awareness of our intersectional problems will bring with it a more aware world and thus perhaps a better one. Not so. Focusing on right, able, wrongs is worthwhile. Blaming all disparities on discrimination leads to more political polarization and individual failure. Studies show that perceived discrimination is heavily connected with lower grades, less ag academic motivation, and less persistence when encountering an academic challenge. That's certainly the case for fighting discrimination. It's also the case for not exaggerating its extent or silencing conversations in order to pander to sensitivities. So I know that sounded like a lot of information there and from all these different sections, uh, but I believe, believe me, there's like a hundred times more information that I didn't even go through. But here we've gotten to the conclusion and I just want to read the first section of the conclusion and the conclusion is taught how to build. So here we go. America is struggling right now in a lot of ways, but its largest struggle is the struggle for our national soul. We are so angry at each other right now. That anger is palpable. Where did it come from? It came from the destruction of a common vision. We used to believe in the founding vision, supported by a framework of personal virtue culled from Judeo-Christian morality. We used to see each other as brothers and sisters, not the 1% versus the 99% or the privileged versus the victims. We weren't enemies. We were a community forged in fire and tethered together by a set of values stretching back to the Garden of Eden, a community of individuals working to understand the value of each other as images of God, a community of individuals who believed in our own capacity to change ourselves and the world around us. We can regain that. We must regain that. Our individual and communal happiness depends on us regaining the values we're losing all too quickly. To do so will require boldness. To do so will require sacrifice. And so this gets into the section here uh, where he's going to start giving us a little bit of information on that. So here we go back to the book, page 213. The easiest way to evade responsibility is to avoid teaching our children our values. If we merely let them choose their value systems for themselves, we reason, then we put them in no danger. If we act as neutral arbiters, bubbling them off from the possibility of harm through vague shibboleths about tolerance, though we're never quite specific about just what we're willing to tolerate, we can leave our chosenness behind. In The Fiddler on the Roof, Teve complains, I know, I know, we are the, your chosen people, but once in a while, can't you choose someone else? The answer is obvious. We can opt out. We, all we have to do is stop teaching our children. If we wish for our civilization to survive, however, we must be willing to teach our children. The only way to protect their children is to make warriors of our own children. We must make our children messengers for the truth that matter. That comes with risk, and that is a risk we must be willing to take. As Ronald Reagan put it, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on to them for do the, to do the same. And one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was like in the United States where men were free. 
My father is fond of saying that, that in life, there aren't six directions, east, west, north, south, up and down. There are just two, forward and backward. Are we moving towards something or away from it? Are we teaching our children to march forward, the banner of the civilization in hand, or back slowly away from it, watching the shining city on a hill receding into the distance? So what do we teach our children? When I look at my four-year-old daughter and my two-year-old son, what do I want them to know? What must they know to become defenders of the only civilization worth fighting for? My wife and I will start by teaching our children four simple lessons. And I'm not going to tell you those lessons, suckers. You're going to have to go buy the book and get it. Uh, guys, that's the that's the very end of the book there where he kind of gets into his lessons that he would teach his children. It is absolutely fantastic. But again, I'm doing this on purpose. The entire book, like I said, it's 200 pages of super heady, dense content that gets down into these very, very practical suggestions for how we should even talk to our children. Because most people look at the greater society and we're like, man, I, I just don't know if we can change things. You know, I don't know if there's a politician out there that can basically get us back to where we were. And I would agree with that. But at... Overall, there, there's this gigantic lack of us even focusing on the people that we have the biggest amount of impact on, and that's our families, right? That's our spouses and our children. And so even though that's just kind of a basic cursory overview of the entire book, there are three we reasons uh, that every modern Christian man should read the right side of history, okay? The first reason is that most of us don't even have a cursory understanding of how we got our Western values, Okay. So this book takes us through that narrative, right? Because there's a lot of philosophy in this book, but it's not super deep philosophy. A lot of things that are discussed are discussed kind of in a, you know, in a summary type of stance and not in a way that's, you know, basically exhaustive of a particular ideology. And I think that's a good thing. I mean, you can get into some of the content here. And then if there's a particular philosophy or area of study, um, there, there's a, a billion different splinters that can come off the information that Ben Shapiro talks about in this book. So again, the first reason why every modern Christian man should read this is most of us don't even have a cursory understanding of how we got our Western values. Okay. The second is many men avoid reading things on subjects that are beyond them. Okay. And so I'll just be honest with you guys. Uh, again, I'm not the greatest reader. Yeah. I read about 25 or 30 books a year. And some of you guys are like, that's insane. But then again, I know guys that are read over hundred books a year. Um, and a lot of the books they read are probably more difficult to get through than the ones that I read. But in general, I, I try to, if I'm going to be reading a challenging book, I try to make sure it's, you know, five to 10% beyond me. Right. And the thing about the five to 10% beyond philosophy is it's not something like if you've never even taken a biology class, or, you know, uh, a chemistry class or something like that. If you all of a sudden go to a book about thermodynamics and, you know, rocket propulsion and all the and nuclear this or nuclear that, that's probably not going to work out for you because that's probably like 100% beyond where you're at. But this book, I got to be honest, this was about 10% beyond me. Again, it, it was a short book, but it took me a while to get through it just because I really, really had to dig in. And again, uh, most of us don't even go at something like that. And so I want to encourage you because there's a lot of guys that are like, oh, I love Ben Shapiro, but man, I don't know if I want to read his book. I think I'd rather listen to his podcast. I would say absolutely give this one a go. So again, three reasons every modern Christian man should read the right side of history. The first, most of us don't even have a cursory understanding of how we got our Western values. The second is many men avoid reading things on subjects that are beyond them. And number three, if we don't read books like this, we won't be able to teach others about the lessons inside the books like this. Like we will not be able to... Um, if we don't understand a concept, how are we going to teach it to our children? If we don't understand the concept, how are we going to inform people in our Sunday school, people on our teams, people at work uh, about certain things? Are we going to just constantly be looking around at other individuals trying to get them to maybe save us or, ah, oh, you know what? We don't really need to talk about that. It's not specific enough. It's just not something that's that important. So that would be something that I would say for all of you guys is this is a very important book. I mean, he's going to sell a billion of these books. I mean, it's already the number one nonfiction book on Amazon. It's going to you know, probably force its way onto the New York Times bestseller list. Um, it, it's going to be a very important book. It's kind of like what um, Jordan Peterson's book from last year was. Um, and the 12 Rules for Life basically sold and sold and sold. And it, it led to a lot of different things. I feel like this is going to be the same thing for Ben Shapiro. And so I'm happy that I've, I've got to get to see a little bit of this. And again, we're, we're just ecstatic and tickled to death um, that the, the Daily Wire and Ben Shapiro uh, thought enough of us to send us a uh, advanced copy. And so we're glad we were able to bring a little bit of that to you guys here. So... 
Before we get out of here, we're going to do a quick resilience boost. As you know by now, we are a men's ministry and our mission is cultivating manly resilience. And specifically, guys, we do that by providing content like this podcast that helps forge spiritual, mental, and physical toughness. And so on the mental resilience side of things today, I've got an Amazon link to the book, The Right Side of History, but I also have a YouTube link to an interview that Ben Shapiro did with a guy from uh, Skeptic. It's a skeptic channel, so obviously it's a it's a channel uh, that are ran by atheists and agnostics, agnostics and um, they disagreed quite a bit on some of the things in this book, but I thought it was a very cordial discussion, so I think that's worth your time there. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening to this podcast. If you would, please subscribe on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Google Play and refer your friends to listen and share on social media. Guys, if we deserve a five-star review, please leave us one. That's how we're currently uh, getting bigger and all those different things. And it's only because you're leaving the reviews and leaving a couple sentences. So we really appreciate it. I'm currently booking speaking engagements for the rest of 2019. So if you guys want me to come speak to your men's event, on your podcast, to your team, to your whatever, hit me up, info at undaunted.life. That's the email, info at undaunted.life. The website is www dot undaunted life and you can follow us on instagram and twitter at undaunted life or facebook.com backslash undaunted life check out our free devotionals on the uversion bible app just search undaunted life under plans and we want to thank the band august burns red for allowing us to use their music library for our content the intro outro track on this podcast is their song king of sorrow which is off their latest record entitled phantom anthem the links to all of this are in the description i'm your host kyle thompson remember keep cultivating manly resilience Keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical toughness. Keep seeking the Lion of Judah.